straight over to the face, actually bringing a lot of carbon. And the fact that like the algae and the aquatic plants in the middle of the pot also bringing carbon. And the water intake, very rich in nutrients coming in from the rivers and also coming in from the ocean. So what I see in the pond becoming a very fertile aquatic ecosystem. Yeah. So then also the use of the air. In the past, all the current practices by the fish farms normally they remove the sediment. Yeah. And this sediment it is very rich with organic matter, either coming from the algae, artificial fish, just name it. So in our uh, expansion, which is not far from here, actually. So this is the zero sea plant. So we planted mangrove along the dike so people can walk under the sand. But at the same time, in the past, normally people have to remove the sediment and put it back along the dike. Yeah. But we try to convince them if you remove the sediments that you are actually exposing the organic matter to the air, so it will admit the carbon dioxide. So by doing this, actually the roots of the plant will hold the substrate. So no need to remove the sediment from the pot. Next please. So this is another idea. This is our project site in Banten, which is not far from here. This one. It's a Ramsar site. Every year, thousands, hundreds of thousands of birds coming in from Europe during the winter time in Europe, Central Europe. Eh? So this is Pulau Satu, Pulau Dua. So behind that is actually Bali. It used to be a mangrove forest, and then cleared by the community. So this natural reserve is under threat. People collecting bird eggs, collecting timbers. So what we are doing? So we try to do something behind the island. Yeah. So and then the government also supported our ideas. And the government has the idea to build more economic support of France city. So next please. So this is how it looks like. By the sea, it is the reserve. Yeah, where in the past encroached by the committee collecting the bird eggs. And now we try to interfere. So now quite a number of local community working involved in our project. So they kept collecting of, uh, the fish and also the stream. But at the same time, we put a certain rules that they are not allowed to remove the sediments from the ponds. Next please. Apart from that, in front of the reserve, we trap the sediment using a very simple technology. We were using a fish net. Yeah. This area used to be eroded very severely. So then we were using fish net and then the fish net was stolen by people and then we replaced with the sandbags. So we put layers of layers of the sandbags in front of the reserve. So now when we look like this. This is just in one year time. It used to be very aerobic areas and then it trapped the sediment. This mangrove seedlings, we are not planting it. They grow it by themselves. The seeds coming in from the reserve was away by the river water during the rainy season. So now fully occupied by single species, a phase in here, which is the pioneer species of mangrove. Next species. So uh, now how it links with us with the aquaculture? Actually, there are a number of a kind of a certification currently, but we would like to bring you to the, this one, the Aquaculture Stewards um, Council. Next please. Yeah. So actually, the ASC tried that if we would like our stream to be uh, exported to Europe, yeah, that must follow a certain principle and criteria. So first of all, they are not inventing a new thing. They simply ask us to fulfill the existing regulation, for example, this is the open sea. So this is the port area. This is the river. So then we have to comply with the green belt, which is set up by our presidents in 1990. And we have also to comply with the river bank. So if we comply with that, so then we can have a look what's happened in the past before you started our, we started with our stream farming, whether that area used to be a mangrove forest. So if it is used to be a mangrove forest, then we were demanded 50% of the area need to be uh, rehabilitated. Next, next please. So this is the area where we work. So we are working in Mahakam Delta, East Kalimantan. This one in uh, Bone, South Sulawesi. This one in East Java. So you can see those with green color, actually the mangrove that have been planted in year 2000. So by look at three different aquaculture sites, so actually we can see which one is this sound more environmentally friendly? Next, please. Yeah. So I can show you here. In Banyuwangi, because the fish farmers already started 
planting mangrove trees since the uh, year 2000. Actually, they are getting carbon, 5 tons per hectare per year. But Delta Mahaka, look at this, 11 tons of carbon to circulate because conversions of the mangrove takes time every year. But in Banyuwangi, the fish farmers already putting more uh, mangrove trees back into the environment. Uh, next please. This is very interesting, the last one. This project we did it after the tsunami in Aceh. Look at this. The same place, the same location, but this is my group. We planted exactly at the same day. This is the Kwasor Kaswarina. After three years, we came back and then we measured the carbon. Kaswarina, three years old, we found 18.7 ton carbon per hectare in three years. But look at the mangrove, only 1.3. So what does it mean? If we are interested with the carbon squeeze station, so be aware that a certain species can squeeze much faster compared to the mangrove. Yeah, that one is it. The second is be also aware. C4 funding regarding the soil carbon in the mangrove forest it is quite high. If I'm not mistaken, they found out almost 1,000 ton carbon above ground and below ground. But don't forget, there are quite many of mangrove forests in Indonesia underneath dominated by big, for example, in Sulawesi. North Sulawesi in Gorontalo, and also in Mamuju, West Sulawesi, also in Riau. You find out the mangrove trees above the ground, actually below the ground dominated by big. So it is again, the amount of carbon in this kind of area, it can be much higher than the one reported by C4 recently. Because it is dependent on the how deep the pit is located in that particular area. I think that's all. Yeah. So this is our experiment. We connected, we removed the three years old, two years one. Year. Very interesting to see how the carbon actually is stored in the water. Thank you. Yeah, that's true, because in the Delta Makam, there are actually not too many fish farmers, only a few, but they are, let's say, colonizing quite a huge area of land. So they open up the land every year, so that's why the mangrove is becoming disturbed. But in this Java, they plant the mangrove instead of removing the mangrove. Second question or comment? Yes? Okay, thank you. Um, I'm um, uh, from Central Java Forestry Service. My question is, what kind of fish uh, species that is suitable for uh, the silver fishery? Because um, nowadays we just know the uh, bandon. I don't know the English words for bandon. And um, thank you. Yeah, actually, you can try also using the cockles yeah, in the crank. In our side, I mean the local community now putting the cockles in yeah, the crank. Because the cockles will improve your water quality. Yeah, at the same time, they can harvest it quite a lot. And cockles have a better value in the market compared to the milk fish. Yes, and the final question. Yeah, my name is Hamza Alkin. I'm a student of Bogor Agriculture University. I have two questions for you. First is, getting on the species that you will plant in the fish pond area. It's very, very uh, transforming. I want to know more about uh, the species of the mangrove. Can you tell me what, what kind of species of mangrove that you use in planting? And then the second question is, this pond. If you know that fish pond uh, is fully in the water, uh, so it's like the harder you want to plant in this area. So, do you have specific techniques like the brood and so on and so on for for alleviating these problems? And then the third problem is, do you engage like community for uh, conducting this project? Thank you. Okay, I will answer the last one. Yes, we are engaging community. <laughs> Our project is not only in Banten. Yeah, we started from. Central Java in 1999, it works very well with this kind of concept. And then we moved to Aceh after the tsunami, where we have related with the zero fishery model with 2,000 hectares of mangrove areas. You can check in the Google so how, how the fish looks like now. And then now we move to Flores, an entity. So we are handling about eight villages, also areas, but we try to link it with the issues of resilience 
and also with the rehabilitation. So now we have the project site in Bandung. So that's it. We involve the local community. So regarding the species, actually, Rizovora is quite easy. So at least three different species of Rizovora. Yeah? The Mucronata, Apiculata, and Stilosa. And But the one which is grown by themselves in front of the reserve, yeah? it is the Avicinia. It grows by itself, but we just simply how, how the sediments stay. Thank you very much, Dr. Newman. The second speaker is Jake Brunner, who is uh a regional coordinator of Bayou based in Hanoi. And Jake is going to continue the theme of <coughs> mangrove silver fisheries. In Vietnam, they tend to be called integrated mangrove fruit farms. But he's going to touch on some of the issues regarding organic shrimp production and certification. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk, um, what I'm going to present today comes uh, results from a project, um, a four-year project funded by the German um, Ministry of Environment, implemented by IUCN and SMB in the Mekong Delta. Next. The Delta um, in the south of uh, Vietnam, it's about uh, 70% of all of uh, Vietnam's mangroves, and within there, the province of uh, Cao Mau um, has about 50% of all of Vietnam's mangroves. And within that province, it's rather hard to see, there's <coughs> where there's sort of a peninsula at the bottom, that what, there's one district we're working in which has 25% of Vietnam's mangroves. So if you're interested in working on mangroves in Vietnam, this is the place to be. And this is what it looks like um, from about 500 kilometers. Um, healthy intact mangroves are bright red. This was a, a spot five image taken um, in January 2013, remarkably uh, cloud-free. Uh, the, the areas that are brightest are within a national park, we came out, and uh, a, basically a, a, a coastal zone, about one kilometer wide, uh, which is uh, called a critically, critical protection forest. Our project um, intervenes in the uh, Nungian Forest Management Unit, it's outlined in black, it's about 12,500 uh, hectares, uh, about 2,500 uh, um, shrimp farms. This is what it looks like on the ground. And um, we call it, um, in Indonesia, they call it uh, silver fisheries, integrated mangrove shrimp is the term in Vietnam, but perhaps the most um, accurate uh, term is, is mangrove polyculture, because it's not just the shrimp. It's the fish, mostly uh, bass, sea bass, um, the crabs, mud crabs, um, oysters, um, as well as the, the shrimp, uh, three kinds of shrimp, but I'm just going to take, talk mostly about uh, black tiger. The, it's a distinctive um, form of uh, shrimp production. It's, it's got very low yield, uh, 300 kilo kilograms per hectare per year, compared to commercial large-scale industrial shrimp production, uh, up to 10,000 kilograms, 10 tons per hectare per, per kilograms per year. However, offsetting the, the low yield is very low cost. Uh, no chemicals, uh, I should say no man-made chemicals, no feed, no antibiotics. Um, and because the system is basically a, a natural system, um, <coughs> with tidal flushing, uh, there's good water circulation, um, and because of the low density, very low risk of disease transmission. So unlike many parts of the Delta, it, was, it, it has not been affected by EMS and other, other, other pathogens. It's also the diverse, as I mentioned, it's not just the shrimp, it's also the crab, the fish, the oysters, and so forth. And a study by GIZ looked at sort of um, the, the risk-adjusted uh, net income per hectare per year, and it concludes that um, these kinds of farms are very profitable, over $2,000 per hectare per year in profit, um, compared to more intensive um, uh, shrimp farms of between uh, of just over 1,000. So it's, it's, it's economically viable. The project, as I said, it's, it's a four-year project, German-funded. Um, we're starting off working with 740 farmers uh, in the uh, in Union Forest um, uh, unit. These farmers are being, um, we're working with a company called Bingfu, which is the world's largest shrimp exporter. They exported almost uh, $500 million of shrimp last year, most of the US, 
Japan and Korea, not so much to Europe. Um, and Lingfu was signed five year contracts with all 740 farmers, um, offering a 10% price premium. And critically, um, they agreed to purchase all sides because it's, because it, of a shrimp, because it's a basically a natural system, you get shrimp from, from, from small, this sort of size to sort of small, small lobsters, and they have especially high, high price. So that provides a, a strong financial incentive. We're using the organic uh, aquaculture standard um, produced by nature, developed by Natureland. That's a, a German um, certification body, I guess, like, like FSC, but it specializes in organic products, shrimp, coffee, and so forth. Now this requires a 50% mangrove cover per, nas uh, per national rule. The auditor is IMO, the Institute of Market Ecology. Uh, the, in, the first audit has taken place, or I should say a pre-audit, and the full audit will take place in, in, in the next few months on those 740 farmers. And this this integration of, of mangrove conservation and high value shrimp production is contributing to the sort of provincial vision, if you like, of an organic coast. It's not, it's not only good for the farmers, but it's also very good in terms of trapping sediment uh, to come offset sea level rise, storm production, and so forth. Um, I now want to sort of shift gears a little bit to talk about uh, payments for environmental services. Because Vietnam has been a, a leader in Asia on PBS. Um, between 1993 and 2010, there were two programs, uh, 327, 661, and they basically, they, were, they involved issuing households contracts that paid a certain amount of money, VND, Vietnamese government, uh, per hectare per year uh, to protect and patrol, at least in theory. Um, payments, two, three, four, five dollars per hectare per year. Um, in 2006, a USAID um, project um, implemented by Winrock uh, with IUCN, the Asia Regional Biodiversity Conservation Program, um, piloted a, a PDS system in uh, the Ndong province in southern Vietnam. And as a result of that, they developed, there was a, a, a government decision, um, decision 380, that, that sort of formalized the pilot. And then in 2010, based on the pilot results, that the PDS model, if you like, was, was uh, replicated nationally. And, Decree 99 included, um, he was really focusing on, on terrestrial forests, payments for, for, for forestry environmental services, and he specified payments for hydro, hydropower and, and, and water utilities downstream. So there's some big dams, there's some big bottling plants. Um, uh, Ho Chi Minh is, is uh, 100, 100 kilometers downstream. Um, and these basically, they pay a certain, a certain fee per kilowatt hour generated and um, cubic meters water uh, bottled and sold. In 2012, um, IUCN and GIZ were asked to work on a, on a sort of a, on a next generation of legislation that, that tailored the PES specifically for agriculture as opposed to terrestrial forests. And we, before, or as part of this process, we, we, we looked at the history um, and I've given you a very, very brief overview of um, PES experience in Vietnam. And um, this was published in a, in a, in a report um, led by, by, by C4, I was one of six, six co-authors, that takes what I would call a, um, a critical look of PES implementation uh, in, in Vietnam. <coughs> Next. And what we concluded was that there were some pretty fundamental weaknesses. Um, and there were basically three weaknesses in particular that we had to address. One was low willingness to pay. The buyers, the dams, the bottling plants, are all state-owned companies that are basically just instructed to pay. They're, they're under no obligation to, to make a profit. They basically perform a sort of a, a social as well as an economic function. So for them, it's just another tax. They just added it onto the, to the fee. But there was no particular interest or understanding in the environmental benefits of, of forest production. Um, however, uh, private companies, particularly hydropower plants, um, are reluctant because they are locked into existing contracts. The price of electricity in Vietnam is very low, margin is very low, and so what? Even a small additional payment has been quite fiercely resisted. Um, we're also being concerned about low compliance. Monitoring is basically self-reporting. People are asked, so how do you think you did this? Well, guess what the answer is. Um, and you know, ultimately, you know, there's obviously a conflict of interest, and this is. I would argue, starting to undermine the 
the credibility of the system. It's, it's partly driven by the fact that the government sees these payments for households essentially as a welfare payment. You know, they've got no interest in, 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 in distinguishing or discriminating payments based on performance. They just want to get money into every household. Partly just because of sort of a socialist uh, egalitarian ethic, partly because it just makes the, the scope for, for, for conflict for competitions is lower. And thirdly, um, new market opportunities, cassava, um, increasing biofuels from, from, uh, from China has led to a boom in cassava production. Now, no one, no one saw that coming um, four or five years ago. And it is not just cassava, there are other, other, other products, market prices have fluctuated, um, but uh, broadly increasing. So the opportunity cost of forestry conservation, simply paying people not to cut down trees, sooner or later it's going to come unaffordable. There's just not enough money to pay enough people to, 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 to make a difference. So we're looking at a certificate, this is particularly for the mangroves, we're looking at organic certification if you like, as, as a mechanism to transform the economy to make mangrove conservation pay. And, and in doing so, address these three weaknesses. One is willingness to pay. In the case of the, the, the certified organic trip production, in a sense, the international consumer is the ultimate buyer. Ming Fu, if you like, the processor is the intermediate buyer. They're the ones who sign the contracts and, um, and, and, and pay in terms of premium and, and, the, and the market agreement, the, 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 uh, the purchase agreement. And this, this company, um, it's a private company, has identified organic shrimp as, as a key market um, opportunity. We think it's not just a, a financial issue. We also believe it's very likely to be a sort of a branding market um, creation uh, and uh, and, and uh, sort of reputational benefits to the company. So we rate willingness to pay as high. Compliance, um, there's a great deal of M&E. Uh, there's a forest management board, it's basically a local government unit which is responsible for, for law enforcement within the forest management unit. There's an annual audit by Institute of Market Ecology. Uh, there's an internal control system financed by Ming Fu in place. There are farmer groups. Um, we've split up 740 farmers into 27 different farmer groups. Um, and that enables, if you like, a degree of peer pressure. Because if one farmer, one farmer is not compliant with the 50% the mangrove standard, they all fail. It's a very strong incentive to get everyone to cooperate and to comply. And we've also done um, satellite monitoring to confirm what the government tells us um, about mangrove Lastly, permanence. In, in a way, we don't, we're not looking at the trees. We're not, we're not coming at this from a forestry perspective. We're coming at this from a, from, a, from a livelihoods perspective, an economic perspective. We're looking at how do we change the production to enable mangrove conservation, rather than how much does it cost to protect a tree. And, and by doing so, we think we, there's a high degree of permanence. There are significant upfront costs, up front costs of training, uh, the GIS working, people provide toilet kits. Um, but the incremental costs are modest. Once you're certified, there's a strong incentive to stay certified. And almost that. Um, that's it. Thank you. <laughs>
they are the sort of the day to day bread and butter. They keep the family going. Um, so it's, it's, it's very diverse. Um, I can't remember the exact breakdown of that web well, net profit, but I think about half of it is from the shrimp and half of it is from the, the non shrimp non products. Um, and although I'm not a, a specialist, but essentially they sort of occupy different um, strata within the, within the water column. These, these, these ponds are about 1 meter, 1 meter 20 deep, relatively deep. And then you've got the crabs and the oysters, um, uh, which occupy uh, different, uh, different issues. <coughs> yeah, uh, my name is Rizal from TNC, the Nature Conservancy. Uh, my question is about the shrimp market. You mentioned that there's a 10% premium price, and you take all sides. Uh, is it taking all sides or harvesting all sides of the shrimp is a little bit against the sustainability of harvesting? So you cannot keep the little ones for the young generations to harvest for the next time. <coughs> What does it mean in all sides? Well, it's, it's entirely voluntary. Uh, it's up to the farmer what size he wants to sell. But there's a very sort of an exponential decline in price. It's not a linear decline as you get smaller and smaller. So there's a strong incentive not to sell the small ones. <coughs> right. So there's a minimum uh, measurement that you cannot sell. There, there is. And, and, and the way they do it is, is, is pieces per kilogram. That's the, that's the measure.
For possible financing mechanism, we have Red Plus, and part of the plus is afforestation, reforestation. Uh, we can also look at the increased use of harvesting wood products and the substitution involved with uh, using wood products uh, as a substitution for fossil fuel and other, and other uh, sources. Next slide. I will be talking a bit about Red Plus, the voluntary market, and then last but not least, uh, CSR, which I think has the uh, most potential for mangrove conservation and protection. So we've learned from the emission trading system in Europe and Australia and uh, now with the cap and trade system in California, there are opportunities to look at uh, soil carbon and above ground carbon within these emission trading systems. The Kyoto re regime has been extended for uh, another eight years, but it doesn't include um, the uh, forest-based carbon stocks. Uh, CDM doesn't also include soil carbon for small projects. And as we've learned in the process of going through these projects, they're extremely expensive. So there's uh, an estimate here of $160,000 plus $14,000 every five years for verification. This is way too high for a mangrove conservation project to endure. There's also a problem with scale. Um, for these projects to be commercially viable, they need to be quite large. And so with coastal mangrove systems, you're talking about then pooling various projects together into one consolidated project or landscape, if you will. Next slide. So we have also the voluntary carbon uh, market, and this would include Red Plus and agriculture and Afalu sector. Soil carbon can indeed be included in these small projects, and they will fetch a higher price, you can call them uh, a charismatic carbon, I've heard the word Birkenstock carbon, there's different types of carbon out there, and there's different ways you can market your carbon under the voluntary market to get a higher price. And of course, if you look at the California system, you may actually fetch a bigger price in that part of the world than you will in, in this part of the world. There's also new methodologies that are emerging. There's a peak rewetting methodology that just came out. And uh, this may allow us to take advantage of hydrological cycle changes. Uh, this is an example from our colleague from Indonesia with uh, fish ponds. And uh, there may be opportunities with looking at the hydrologic cycle and what we can do to incentivize more projects through the BCS mechanism. Next slide. Last but not least, uh, these are the considerations that I wanted to, to, to walk you through. Uh, the value of these carbon credits may not exceed $200 per hectare per year, even under the best conditions. And this would mean that we need at least 1,000 hectares to break even for the project costs, the startup costs. This is the, the project development document that consultants charge a lot of money to produce. That's the startup cost. And the value also may not um, produce enough credits when you take into consideration the buffer that you would need, uh, specifically looking at systems that are under high risk. So the cost of setting up these projects is quite high. Then if you look at the institutional requirements for doing this type of mangrove conservation, we also recognize that we need local institutions, good governance, uh, open and transparent processes, and that also needs to be considered when designing these projects. Last but not least, we need the policy and legislative environment to support ownership of these carbon credits so that these projects can actually be viable and communities can actually benefit from these projects. So that's a very important last point about the governance structures and the legislative and policy environment for markets to really function properly. So uh, under the existing cap and trade systems, most of them don't allow for uh, forced carbon credits. The California market does allow for some overseas credits in Red Plus, but it's capped at a, a very small amount. And most of those are coming from Mexico at this time. Um, red projects in threatened degraded mangrove areas with deep soils may actually uh, generate the most carbon credits. 
and projects, as we heard just now, uh, with abandoned fish ponds, uh, may, may make a lot of sense. The methodologies that are out there uh, still need to be refined and tested to make sure that the voluntary uh, carbon market can, can tap into this mangrove uh, conservation projects. But we still don't really understand the mechanisms because there aren't a whole lot of projects to, uh, to learn from. And that's one of the main things that we wanted to start this project is to start seeing lessons learned from various income generation opportunities and looking at the carbon benefits affiliated with that. So now let me move on to uh, a bit of corporate support. Sure. What? Thank you. Um, just talked about the compliance market, the voluntary market. The area that we see as uh, emerging right now for mangrove conservation projects is really CSR. And like I said at the beginning, the demand is there. The companies see uh, mangrove conservation and rehabilitation as being a quote unquote sexy project. It's got a lot of attributes that, that corporations really like. They get to, to take pictures of themselves with their communities, planting trees. It's very easy to do. So it's got a lot of popularity here in the Southeast Asian context. And it's got a lot of direct corporate social responsibility opportunities for communities and companies to really see immediate benefits. Next slide. So the, the project that we're about to undertake is uh, over the next 18 months, is a collaboration between the MFF, FAO, and the USA Leaf Project. Keep going. It's focused on uh, income generation from community coastal management in three countries, Thailand, Vietnam, and Pakistan. Next. The project uh, objective is to develop a low cost mechanism and uh, enable these uh, mangrove conservation carbon emission reduction projects to really provision the funding of two local communities for both livelihood diversification, resource enhancement, and last but not least, coastal protection and conservation. The project rationale, I already talked about most of these. Carbon prices are low. We may not see uh, an increase in the short term. The voluntary market is quite expensive to jump into. Uh, we absolutely need direct market mechanisms to go right to these uh, income generation opportunities and find ways to incentivize alternative livelihoods around mangrove conservation and protection. The project approach is to work uh, closely with existing projects and look at developing a mechanism and seek broader institutional support to increase the robustness and build confidence around these models and then to replicate those models through regional platforms and regional partnerships. Next. There's a, a number of different activities. The first one is really focused on generating knowledge management around what we do know and what we don't know. So a gap analysis, an assessment with experts on what is available, where is the funding going to be available from, and to develop a model that really assesses the amount of carbon storage and sequestration available in different mangrove systems based on latitude, based on density, based on very specific uh, mangrove forest types that would allow us to look at uh, bypassing the whole project development cycle. Next. We then want to look at targeting certain communities that, that will test this approach, engage them, support them, develop these mechani mechanisms, as I mentioned, uh, look at the costs involved and the financing options that we develop, will, will be developing through this project. And last but not least, actually look at how to get lessons learned from this project to regional partners for replication. So that's the project in a nutshell. Um, it will be uh, kicking off hopefully next month. Uh, Jeremy can actually talk more about the nuts and bolts of how the project will run. As he was the project designer when, during his days with FAO, he's now a part of the LEAF team, so I'm lucky to have him. And any questions that you may have, I may or may not defer to him depending on the nature of the question. Thank you. I'd like to
move straight on to a very related uh, presentation by Richard McKenzie, who is from the U.S. Forest Service, and he's going to tell us how to measure mangrove carbon. And then, of course, we'll open up the session for uh, invited questions and comments. Thank you. Uh, so I, uh, I came here from the island of Hawaii, and when we start our meetings, we usually greet everyone, and then you return the greeting back to me. So, aloha mai tako. Uh, Alright, thanks. Uh, so, uh, I'm going to stand up here so I can point at the screen, and I like to move around. Uh, mangroves and peatlands have become priorities in climate change mitigation and adaptation programs, as we've heard in uh, some of the talks today. Next slide. This is largely due to the fact that these ecosystems store massive amounts of carbon that could potentially be uh, permanently stored. And this uh, graph here is uh, a result of a, a collaboration between C4, the U.S. Forest Service, uh, where they quantified carbon pools in mangroves and peatland swamps across the Indo-Pacific. And you can see that carbon storage is significantly higher in mangroves and in peatland swamps compared to other temperate uh, and tropical development forests. And this is largely due to the storage below ground. So these gray-shaded areas represent soils uh, are peats within the mangroves uh, and the peatland swamps. In fact, uh, the values of these carbon stocks can be eight to ten times greater than what we see in upland forests. Now, uh, I, I believe uh, uh, David talked about the, the high sequestration rates of these, these ecosystems. And, and so these high carbon stocks is due to that sequestration, but also due to the fact that these, these sediments, these muds uh, that store these carbon, these carbon stocks are essentially flooded sediments. So the tides come in and when they leave, a lot of the sediment is still retains that water. And so you get these waterlogged conditions. There's not a lot of oxygen. And so the bacteria that would normally decompose these sediments, they can't do their job. And so we can essentially permanently store or bury these carbon pools within these, these ecosystems. And so that's why they have become such an important component in discussions of uh, mitigation and adaptation. Now, unfortunately, many countries around the world, including those in Southeast Asia, lack sufficient information to include wetlands and, and carbon uh, stocks from wetlands in their reporting, uh, at the nat their national reporting to the United Nations, or to develop uh, uh, conservation products to reduce greenhouse gas emissions through mangrove conservation. And so, next slide, the Forest Service, again working with C4 and supported in large through the United States uh, Agency for International Development, or USAID, uh, came up with a Sustainable Wetlands Adaptation and Mitigation Program, or SWAMP, uh, to, to provide training uh, to a lot of these nations around the world. And so, the, the overall objective is to provide management agencies, policymakers, and scientists with credible information needed to make sound decisions uh, relating to the role of tropical wetlands and climate change mitigation and adaptation. Next slide. And the main goals of the project are one, to quantify greenhouse gas emissions from wetlands and related land use change. Two, to quantify carbon stocks uh, in tropical forests of wetlands of the world and associated uh, land uses. Three, develop ecosystem modeling tools and remote sensing technology to scale that carbon up uh, from the, the plot to the land scale, scale, so we can get the most effective uh, uh, measures of those carbon stocks. Uh, four, quantify the role that tropical wetlands play in climate change adaptation and mitigation. And then finally, probably most importantly, is develop capacity building and re outreach activities by working with, with governments and scientists from countries, uh, not only to uh, help them quantify these carbon stocks and greenhouse gas uh, inventories, but to develop uh, projects to address how land use change, how, how management can influence those stocks. Um, so that's the SWAMP program. Uh, next slide. So to date, uh, I believe the SWAMP has been up and running. The official SWAMP has been up and running for about two years. Uh, the whole project has been about a four year uh, program. Daniel can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but to date, uh, we have, SWAMP has been or is being used in 22 different countries. Uh, 10 of those uh, are in 
in Southeast Asia. Uh, there should be a, a, a circle right now in Cambodia because we just got back from Cambodia uh, two days ago. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, it's a very uh, effective comparable um, protocol uh, that addresses a lot of the, 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 um, the, the statements made by IPCC in terms of, of carbon um, reporting. And for those of you that are interested in learning more about it, we have the C4 actually has a publication by Boone Kaufman and Dan Donato uh, that goes through the, the protocol in a little more detail. Uh, I could literally give you a, a, a week-long lecture on how to do the training or how to do the protocol, but they said I only have 10 minutes. Um, so and I, there's something else I want to talk about. But uh, I, I encourage you to, to, to look into that document. Uh, in a nutshell, uh, what we do is we set up several plots in the mangroves, and within each plot we have uh, clustered subplots, either in a line or in this cross fashion here. And this allows us, uh, we've got the five subplots in a, in a quarter hectare, um, excuse me, 0.25 hectare plot. Within each uh, subplot, uh, we've made various measurements that are identified in the protocol. Next slide. And this allows us to quantify four of the five major carbon pools that have been identified by the IPCC uh, for carbon reporting. This includes carbon stored in trees, carbon stored in non tree vegetation. Uh, carbon stored in down uh, in dead woody debris, and carbon stored below ground in soil. We usually don't uh, focus on the forest floor, the leaf litter, because most of the leaves are flushed out with the tides, uh, pulled down into the sediments by crabs, and essentially become part of the soil. So they're usually a very small uh, component of the carbon pools. And so uh, that's, that's the SWAMP project. So again, it's a protocol that you can use to quantify carbon stocks, uh, to, to look at change over time, uh, to, if you want to develop a carbon project, this is an excellent method uh, to use for that. Or if you're uh, reporting out to, uh, at the national level, it helps uh, you, you determine your greenhouse gas emissions from, from land use, from converted mangroves and intact mangroves. I'd like to change gears now and talk to you about another project that has been a collaboration between C4 uh, and, and the US Forest Service. And that's impacts the sea level rise uh, on mangrove forests. So it's uh, probably no surprise to everyone here that sea level is rising. Uh, it's essentially uh, nearly doubled since 1990, and it's predicted to increase by up to two meters by 2100, depending on which climate change scenario you look at it. And so sea level rise is real. It's, it's probably predicted to be the greatest threat, the greatest climate change threat to mangrove forests, and we should expect to see loss of mangroves uh, uh, as they, they, they drown from, from high water levels or shift in vegetation. Now that being said, on a positive side of things, mangroves are very dynamic ecosystems. And when we talk about developing adaptation mechanisms for mangroves, they've already developed an adaptation to sea level rise. They've been around for millions of years, and they've survived climate change and sea level rise in the past. And they've done it using two mechanisms. Next slide. The first uh, that we heard about earlier is the sedimentation that occurs in the mangroves. So you have rivers and the ocean delivering <coughs> sediments into the mangrove forests, as well as that large amount of below ground root production. So as those roots grow and the sediments accumulate, the mangroves forests can rise at similar rates of sea level. And we can see that here nicely in this graph that I stole uh, from, from Daniel Alonghi. Uh, where he plotted on the, on the y-axis, sedimentation rate, on the x-axis, mean sea level rise. And these are several mangrove forests where he was able to get sedimentation rate information. This dashed line here is a one-to-one -one relationship between sediment rate and sea level rise. So any dots above that line are mangroves that are keeping up with or exceeding the current rate of sea level rise. So this is kind of an optimistic message that uh, appears that many of the mangroves that he included in this graph are currently keeping up with the current rate of sea level rise. Now, what does this mean for the future? Uh, we don't know. Uh, increased rates of sea level rise, uh, they, they, they may not be able to keep up with them. The second mechanism that allows mangroves to keep up with sea level rise is their ability not only to rise up, but to move inland. And this is a, a graph uh, from a, a paper in the 90s uh, where they were looking at mangrove distribution in 1994 and 1970, or excuse me, 1949 and 1977. 
This dashed line here represents the seafront of the mangroves in 1949. You can see that it's, they've migrated inland approximately half a kilometer. So, mangroves have this ability to adapt and to, 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 to uh, be resistant to sea level rise. Now the problem with this is that today, next slide, we like to build our roads right here, right, right behind the mangroves, on berms, where if the mangroves can keep up the sea level rise, they'll hit those berms and they can't go anywhere. And so they may be able to keep up the sea level rise, but because of the infrastructure that we've built behind them, we may essentially be um, negatively affecting their ability to keep up the sea level rise. Okay, so with that, that in mind, I'm, I like to be optimistic. I like to ask, what can we do uh, to save these mangroves as opposed to how many mangroves are we gonna lose? And so, next slide. So we came up with this specific sea level rise monitoring network. And the, the, the goal of this network is to identify and protect critical mangrove areas that are naturally positioned to survive sea level rise, those that can migrate inward, as well as establish baseline data and monitor their responses. So how fast are they rising or falling relative to sea level rise? And when we identify those mangroves that are keeping up with sea level rise, those should be prioritized for some conservation effort. So minimize the amount of cutting, minimize the amount of clearing for aquaculture or charcoal. Those are the, the, the pristine systems that we need to, to protect so that they can continue to keep up with sea level rise and continue providing us with the ecosystem services that, that we rely on. And the way that we monitor this, uh, we use three tools. The first is rock surface elevation tables, or R sets. And these are very simple pieces of equipment. What you do is you go into the mangrove and you pile drive stainless steel rods until that rod hits the bottom of the peak. So it hits a, a point of resistance. Next slide. Then you concrete in a receiver. Next slide. And you go out periodically and attach this R set arm to the top of your R set rod. And there are fiberglass um, pins that you slide down and that rest on the surface of the mangrove. And then you measure, because this rod is fixed now, because you've driven it down to a point of refusal and you've concreted it into place, this is a fixed distance. And so you measure the distance between the arm and the mangrove. And so it wouldn't be a presentation by me if I didn't have one of my cartoons. Next slide. So, if the mangrove is keeping up a sea level rise, this is what it would look like. Next slide. So as you come every year, those pins would rise up, the distance between the arm and the mangrove decreases. Next slide. If the mangrove is subsiding or sinking, next slide, the distance between the arm and the mangrove increases. And now your mangrove forest will be flooded, it's a positive feedback, the, the trees will eventually drown and die. Uh, so that's, that's how the general theory behind uh, rod sets. Next slide. The next uh, tool we use is surface secretion. This is a little simpler. Uh, you essentially go into the marsh with a fine clay powder and you sprinkle it onto the marsh surface and then you come back uh, a month or six months or a year later. Next slide. You take a core. So this is, this is the core. This is that marker horizon and you measure essentially the distance the height of the sediment above that horizon. And you know the time that's passed, so you can look at surface accumulation. So both of these techniques, these first two techniques are great, simple uh, techniques to measure um, uh, uh, mangrove accumulation. You can install an R set for about $500, 500 US dollars, and then you have to purchase uh, an arm and, and other equipment to read it. Uh, the problem is that you have to go back once a month, every six months, every year, and so it takes time before you actually get the data that you want. The third independent technique that we've been using are naturally occurring radioisotopes. These are particles that are continually falling out of the atmosphere that are naturally produced. And so you essentially go and take a core of the peat, you section it every two centimeters, and you measure how radioactive those sections are. And essentially the, the radioactive decay uh, with depth gives you a sedimentation rate in centimeters per year. Now you can also use this information, instead of looking at depth, you can look at total carbon accumulation, and you can measure below ground carbon accumulation rates, which also identifies mangroves that are not only keeping up with sea level rise, but are more productive and are storing more carbon 
than other ecosystems, other mangroves uh, that might not be. Uh, next slide. How am I doing? Okay, I'm going to come to So this is an example here, preliminary results. These are some cores we took from the Republic of Palau and Vietnam. Two completely different mangroves. Uh, these are uh, from Khmer, uh, these blue cores here. Uh, so mangroves along the, the Mekong, lots of sediment being delivered into the systems. You can see that they are, are well above this dashed line. The sites that we sampled appear to be in a pretty good, pretty good shape. In Palau, they're kind of all over the place. This is a high island coastal mangrove ecosystem, less sediments coming in. Um, and so some of these systems uh, appear not to be keeping up with sea level rise and suggest that managers should look at those systems and identify what they need to do uh, to more effectively conserve or restore those systems. Uh, so then I guess I'll end on this note, uh, and that's mangrove conservation and restoration cannot be done alone. It requires many people and partners who most importantly are willing to get dirty. So if we work together, I think we can we can try to identify mangroves that may be um, more resilient uh, to sea level rise. And uh, if you want to contact me about any of the things I've brought up, this is my, my email address. And can I show one more real quick slide? <coughs> one more slide. Can you? I, I think it's. I pulled it out, but I want to pull it up. Next. 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 This one. No. Back. Okay, I wanted to share this result. This is, these are the elevation change over time from one of the mangroves that we installed in our set on Koshrai. These are my collaborators from USGS, Ken Krauss, and Michael Cormier. And what they showed is over time, they saw an increase in, in elevation of the, the, that mangrove compared to sea level rise. In 2001, it started to drop. In 2002 and 2004, it significantly decreased. The reason for this drop is that someone went out by their R set and cut down the trees around the area. They didn't deforest it, they didn't clear cut it, they cut down a few trees. And it resulted in a significant decrease in accretion rates in those plots. So we need to think about this in terms of managing forests for resilience, for conserving them, and maintaining the ecosystem services that they provide that intact mangroves are, may have the potential to keep up with sea level rise, but if we don't keep that in mind, we could potentially lose them to sea level rise in the future. So with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Again, in the interest of time, I'm going to open up the discussion. So Keith, could you put the second slide I have? To keep the discussion focused, we have a few suggested key questions, and we want to think in particular about the next steps. You've heard some very innovative financing mechanisms, opportunities with carbon, with certification of organic shrimp. What do we do next? How do we scale up these initiatives to reach the landscape level? What R&D research and development may be needed to continue to improve the models and the, the measurement techniques that, that Rich has, has explained? And the third and perhaps most important issue, where will the investment come from to take forward some of these very good initiatives? So with those few comments, please uh, introduce yourself and give us your question or comment on what you've heard so far. Thank you. My name is Taufik from Star Resources, based in Bali. So I'm interested in the amount of carbon project, especially addressing the third question. Can be as a number of it can be a little plus can be scaled up. So how how do you address the problem of uh, land tenure rights, property rights in in in, in uh, mangrove carbon project? Because as we know that uh, the property rights is the, the, the fundamental basis for market based conservation. The second one is how how can we design an effective distribution of benefit mechanism to local people? So because I, I thought that I think that's the biggest challenge for my of carbon project. David, could you explain you talked about bundling and that implies lots of different owners of land and mangrove forests would be encouraged to cooperate 
bundle that. Well, yeah, I mean, when you use the word bundling, there's there's two two ways it could be uh, used. One is getting a number of different coastal communities to pool together to do almost like a cooperative approach um, so that you get a larger landscape uh, and the economy of scale that you would need for the project to be economically viable. The other way the word bundling is used is in terms of ecosystem services that can actually be marketable so that you're bundling more than one service and trying to attract investors from multiple markets. So I just wanted to clarify the word. When I was talking about bundling, I meant that we're trying to get the geography, enough geography, enough of the coastal landscape um, under one quote unquote carbon project so that it has the right economy and scale. The question about how do you design a benefit distribution system then when you have multiple communities along that coastline is a very complicated uh, design issue. I, if I had the answer, I think I would be a very rich man at this point because I'd be developing projects left and right. But the, the reality is that I think we need to be thinking about benefit distribution systems in your respective countries. I, I don't want to say that you know I, I have the answer to change land tenure in your respective countries, but think about benefit distribution systems in terms of existing institutional mechanisms or market mechanisms that exist already in your country context. So some countries have what's called a village development fund or a mechanism for uh, social services to uh, flow through a community. Um, we're not talking necessarily about monetary benefits. Did I say something very controversial? <laughs> um, not monetary benefits, but social services. So there may be things that the community would prefer to have um, that is you know, can be delivered through this project. It could be a better school, it could be access to a market through a road system or a better pier to get their products to market. These are all things that could be, uh, could be built into a benefit distribution system so that we're not only thinking about monetary benefits but associated multiple benefits that uh, society wants and needs from that coastal community. Thank you, there. Next question, comment, please. Jeff? Uh, Jeffrey Blade with U.S. Forest Service. I'm based in Bangkok. Um, this may be more of a comment than a question. I'll try to be brief. Um, since we're talking about sustainable landscapes, um, maybe I can solicit commentary, uh, opinion from our distinguished panelists. So in this last question here about institutional and policy challenges, um, one of the things that I know that we're all aware of and thinking about is that the, the challenges in the mangroves aren't necessarily only from sea level rise, but I'm really glad that Rich put up that last slide because um, for mangroves to accrete, to track sea level rise, they need sediment. And the sediment is coming from upstream, from way upstream in some cases. And policies um, for putting an infrastructure upstream from the mangroves could actually starve them from receiving that sediment. Everything from hydropower dams to dredging the river channels themselves. Um, so I'm just curious about how you know we could kind of think a little bigger, not just like looking into mangrove restoration projects or even conservation at the site itself, but how do we look way upstream to actually make the intervention sustainable? No, I fully agree, Jeff. And that's the landscape perspective that we have to introduce. And it's not only the, the lack of sediment, but also the lack of fresh water. You go to a country like Pakistan, where there is a policy to let not a drop of fresh water reach the sea. That's death for mangroves, frankly. So uh, I think the landscape approach, as you rightly pointed out, we have to look at the watershed to the coastline and beyond. Uh, it's, comment from you, Richard. Yeah, I just wanted to add that that's a great point, um, Jeff, about the, the sediment loads. But I, I just want to uh, iterate that or reiterate that 
there are healthy sediment loads, so you can have low sediment loads. And that's one of the points that that last slide that I showed, Ken Krause pointed out that on high islands, the fact that the sediment loads are coming down from the mountains, that they, those mangroves probably keep up the sea level rise compared to atolls, where there's not a lot of sediment load. And, and of course, building dams will influence that. But that being said, too much of a good thing can be bad. And so if you have too much deforestation growing up in the watershed, too much sediment coming in, you can actually smother the mangroves if there's too much sediment. And similar, there, then there's other uh, impacts of uh, increased nutrient loading from, from uplands as well that we're not sure how those would impact. I know we have, I want to be careful with my uh, voice <laughs> popping microphone. I'm being very um, We have a colleague from the Nature Conservancy in the room. I, I heard one question from DNC. There's an approach in uh, Papua New Guinea uh, called the Ridge to Reef uh, landscape approach, and we're actually uh, USA Leaf and USA Marsh program in Papua New Guinea are teaming up on a training exactly to look at the full landscape from the terrestrial side to the mangrove system so that we are preparing our training approaches to look at both aspects of the terrestrial carbon accounting and mangrove carbon accounting so that we have a full reach to reach approach in, uh, in Madang and Manos as two landscapes that have the same type of issues that you're talking about with upstream impacting the, the mangrove systems along the, the coast zone. Yes, sir. I'm in charge. Yeah. Um, David, you just mentioned that uh, the, there is a question about the benefit sharing distribution, um, which needs to be solved. I just want to, to let the people know that Fairtrade is currently working on this, uh, together with Gold Standard um, and Gold Standard. It's not me. <laughs> and Gold Standard has also been moving into mangrove just uh, uh, recently, so um, uh, yeah, just to touch on. Jeremy? Yes, uh, uh, Jeremy, policy advisor from the USA Lead Program. I have a question for, two questions for Richard. Um, do you have any uh, estimate of the cost per hectare or the cost per area for implementing the swap? Uh, methodology to um, measure uh, the mangroves and have the 22 locations where you've uh, carried out the training, have you actually got carbon measurements for those areas? Uh, so the answer to your second question is yes, we do. One of the, the I don't know if I was clear in the goals, but we are um, working with C4 to build a, a global database on carbon stores uh, in mangroves as well as developing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, factors for mangroves and different um, uh, mangroves for different types of land use. The cost per hectare, uh, it depends on, I guess, the uh, the, the crew size and uh, the, the cost uh, per day for that crew, as well as how easy it is to access the sites. Um, I, I guess a way to answer that question would be looking at the variability in the mangrove carbon stocks, we've come up with a number of 44 plots should be installed in mangroves across the country to capture that variability. So that's 44 plots times five subplots. And so if you can easily access those plots, it's going to be uh, more cost effective if you need boats, if you have to hike into the mangroves. If it's really hot um, and the crews are working slow, it can affect that. Ability. But there is a, uh, I believe, um, Dan did not have come up with a cost breakdown. Um, and if it's not in that protocol, if you email me, uh, Jeremy, I can, I can send you that breakdown to put together. But it, it ultimately, it's going to depend on, on what the daily rate is of the people that are working with you. Any last questions, comments? If not, I'm going to put the panelists on the spot and ask if each of you to come up with your recommendation of the next step forward or an important researchable issue in your field of expertise. Literally 10 seconds each gentlemen. <laughs> Yes, if you 
Wait, I've got the mic. I've got the microphone. Uh, I guess the way to move forward, I think we need to, to, to monitor mangroves and identify those that are most resilient to sea level rise and, and, and develop mechanisms to conserve those. Uh, those that are not resilient, we need to figure out ways to restore them. Otherwise, I fear uh, that we may lose many of these ecosystems. Well, my next step is clearly the project that I just presented, but um, I think we need to have viable market mechanisms to incentivize mangrove conservation and protection. And for me, that means let's figure out which aspects of the carbon market or other payment for ecosystem service markets are viable for mangrove conservation and try to tap into those. I'd like to see a proliferation of projects around the region because um, as you know, everyone that's presented, there's a unique opportunity around mangrove systems for sustainable mangrove management and also sustainable livelihoods affiliated with those management regimes. Okay. Um, the situation in Vietnam is rather unusual. You have 40,000 hectare um, integrated mangrove shrimp landscape. Um, in a way, it's, we're blessed. We're very, it's very unusual. Um, I've seen a lot of places that don't look at all like that. They look more like moonscapes. Parts of uh, Rakhine, the state of Myanmar, parts of, uh, parts of Bangladesh. And I guess the question for me is how, if mangroves are so good, all these good things for us, how do you go, how do you go from a moonscape, if you like, to a more agreeable, productive landscape? Um, I think the technology is there, but it takes at least five or eight years to restore that landscape. So that implies significant transition costs. And um, thinking out loud here, every time, for me, I could not think of a better red focus to cover those transition costs. Thank you, Jeff. you have the last word. Okay. So, from my presentation, I raised issues regarding the silver whistle and also the hybrid engineering. As I know, many of you may be aware, but the Java Island is really suffering because of the erosion and subsidence. Jakarta subsided, what I heard, about 20 centimeters per year, and Central Java and Samara is about 8 centimeters per year. So, actually, we are now running with fine. In one side, we have problem with this subsidence, and the other side, with the erosion. So we try to focus on one thing, which is related with hybrid engineering. This is a soft structure, not putting the hard structure from the coastal areas. This is to protect our island, not only Java, but also the other part of Indonesia. The number one, regarding the hybrid engineering, especially on the very uh, resilient area, I mean, very sensitive area, which is already eroded. The second thing that is related with the silver system. Yeah, and same time by how we can actually produce strength, but in a sustainable manner. But the same time also we discuss the carbon. So the problem is now can we actually get a kind of uh, financial benefit by having mangroves along the pond uh, area? We can sell the strength, we can sell the, 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 the fish, but can we sell it the country? So that's what I would like to propose, because currently we have a project which is not far from here. We receive it from a Spanish company. It is a very small project related with the carbon offset. So that company is trying to offset it, their emission. So that's the slide I show you actually something related with the carbon offset uh, funded by a Spanish company. Thank you. Okay, Trevor Gassi back. Um, I'll conclude now. I think the point to take home is that mangroves are very valuable in terms of the ecosystem and the services they provide, not least carbon. But they're a fragmented ecosystem, unlike terrestrial forests, they are interconnected with water and sediment services that come from far away uh, up in the watershed. So the management, the scaling up to a landscape level is going to be particularly challenging. But the value of those services that Mango provide are extremely high. So with those few words, I'd like to thank the panelists again, and uh, thank you all for attending.